Um, what I'm doing is creating a master um, mix. That's, as far as I'm concerned, the master mix for that song in perpetuity. So, you know, when they pull out the, the, the master tape from the vault of Led Zeppelin, you know, and they all of a sudden decide to remaster it for, you know, um, whatever, 2002, um, that was a conscious decision by the band to, you know, to upgrade um, and modernize their their um, their recording in in the in the you know in the modern age, um, because the original masters were either too low or I don't know maybe they lost them. <laughs> um, I mean the the original pressing masters because you, you you guys may or may not know but you know all of that stuff had to be archived so there's a, a metal master that's created in the in the in the uh, mastering studio I don't, I don't know if any of this makes any sense to you guys uh, I don't really know your background but in those days you know they created a metal master that was a, a, a record um, uh, that was a vinyl record. Well, it wasn't vinyl; it was acetate. Um, but uh, um, so, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, mastering is is a thing that exists for a period of time. Um, you know, in my early days, you know, dance club music and remixes were were a big thing. They were just starting out when I first started um, engineering and, and assisting. And, um, you know, mastering engineers had to, had to communicate with, with the mixing engineers about where that vinyl was going to be used. Because if it was going to be used in the club, then there could only be a certain amount of time um, on the on the vinyl because the deeper the bass, the less groove space there was. Um, so, and and that's a concept you guys can talk about if you don't know what that means. But so, in other words, the actual equalization that the that the mix engineer and the mastering engineer would include in the song was based on how much time was on the side of vinyl. So if you then bring that into today's standard of now we we send MP3s out to our audience, um, the mastering engineer has a whole different set of things. You know, before before this we had what we had DVDs. Before that we had cassettes. Each one of those delivery formats had a mastering technique that needed to be dealt with okay that's not a mixing technique that's not a master um, master tape master uh, because it's the same word I don't know what to call it but when I create a master it is <clears throat> it is my version of that song that I think emotionally encapsulates what it needs to be now the mastering engineers job is to make sure that it, it is appropriately mastered to mix with other material on a delivery format. So whether that delivery format is iTunes, the radio, Spotify, or whatever, it's the mastering engineer's job to get that to work in that format. Not my job. I mean, of course, it's my job, too. But... You know, my real job is to make sure that emotionally that song does business on every format. Whether whether it's a you know a hundred thousand dollar stereo that some audio audio file has, um, if if that genre is is included in in this in this um, in this song, or you know earbuds, um, and it's the mastering engineer's job to make sure that the delivery of that works. So um, maximization is just 
it's just today's cassette tape duplication system as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's no, I don't care. Doesn't matter to me. Sure, I listen to my my what my mastering engineer does. I don't want him to suck out the life of something that I've created, but I also rely on the best mastering engineers in the world to do their thing to make sure that it's. He knows his job. A pro knows his job. He knows his job is to make sure it's right for the delivery system that's in place today. That's what a mastering engineer's job is. And, and I, re I rely on the best ones to do that job well. As far as level wars, I, I, I don't know what that means. That doesn't mean anything to me. Say that again? No, uh, uh, Do you have a, a basic setting on that that you work to, or do you adjust on the fly? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I adjust for every single song. So, I mean, uh, it's going through. My, my, my chain is a Chandler, um, curve bender, equaliz equalizer, to a pendulum, uh, uh, compressor, limiter, to um, a couple of V76 pre's, into my um, um, into my Lavery A to D converter, and so it's always going through that stuff, and I just tweak it based on what I what I what I hear and what I need. Um, so are, is, is are the kids asking these questions and giving you these questions? Because yeah. I definitely want to get their questions. Just explain that we took questions from the students and fed them through We took questions before because we, we knew your time was, was limited. Um, okay. So we asked all the, all the guys here. We, we've got about three different uh, music courses represented in this room at the moment. Uh, each different different levels, different uh, types of music that they're recording. So um, we're just kind of trying to <coughs> feed questions that, that uh, cover things for everyone. Um, okay. How, all right. Uh, we're almost done. So give me one more question. Make it a good one. He wants a question, uh, a legendary story from the rock and roll business. From the road. From the road. Did you hear that? I did not. He said, um, just, just as, a, as a final thing, if you've got a legendary kind of rock and roll story from, from the business, an anecdote to the guys because we've been picking your brain uh, early in the morning. Uh, um, well, because it's early in the morning, let me, let me, let me, Think of one, uh, one quickly. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I, I probably have quite a number of them, and, and most of them shouldn't be talked about on the internet. But, <laughs> but um, one that one that comes to mind quickly, um, and and is quite uh, poignant. Um, uh, you know, I mixed uh, One More Chance by uh, Notorious B.I.G. And um, the mix took a very long time. I actually worked on it for about two weeks because uh, it was a complete re-remix, technically. It was a complete redo. It was, a, it was a, basically a new song when it was done. And um, uh, so there's a lot of production going on. And, and, and Big actually had to rewrite everything. Um, but... Um, but Big never wrote anything down. So um, he would just sit in the room next to me while I was coming up with my mix. It. And he would, and we, we rented out the Hit Factory for two weeks, which is not a cheap thing. Um, in fact, I even, in the, in the interim, I flew to LA, mixed the Johnny Gill song, and then came back to, to New York and, and, and you know, sat back in the seat and it was this it was as if I hadn't left like I think they had just been in the room like
Well, he's offline. Yeah. It's his lawyer, man. His lawyer's just sitting there with it. No. <laughs> Don't tell us. <laughs> Disclaimer. <Yeah. laughs> what happened, bro? I will have 20 miles Well, let's just say thank you and give a round of applause. Thanks for a round of applause. You might want to finish the story. I have the story. I want to hear the end of the story. He's blatantly going to finish it. Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. So we, we heard that you returned. It's like they never left. They've just been sitting in the room doing... <laughs> yeah. Um... So, uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's as if uh, I never left. Like, I, I think my, my Coke can that, you know, I had left on a, on a, on a table next to me was, uh, was left, you know, half full exactly the way I left it when I went to L.A. and I came back three days later, it was still there. Um, but uh, so it was time for Big to do his, uh, his rhyme and, and do that. So it, uh, essentially what he did was he just sat next to me and uh, he was rolling blunts and smoking, and I thought, I didn't know he was really paying much attention to what was going on. But he just sat there, just, I was just rolling tape around, rolling tape around. I was working while he was sitting there. And then probably about three days later, um, he said, all right, get the mic up. And of course, I already had the mic up, and, and uh, Brian. One take, top to bottom, bada boom, bada bang. No paper, no nothing. There was nothing written down. Uh, and, uh, and then he, you know, finished, put his coat on and said, all right, I'm out of here. And, and he left. I don't know that we actually spoke much other than me asking him whether or not he wanted lunch. So it was kind of fun and interesting and, and one of those, those rock and roll stories that you know, there's chaos going around at all times in the studio in those days, um, because, you know, you know, Faith Evans is there with her kid, and I'm holding on to her kid while Faith is doing a vocal, and I'm punching in with her her child, like trying to touch everything and get to mommy, and you know, and there's people running in and out, you know, phone calls and whatnot going on, and vocals being done and production being done, and Big is just sitting there the whole time memorizing what he's going to do, knocking it out in his head, and just, it was just hilarious the way he just walked in there, did it, put his coat on, left. I couldn't believe it. I, I just thought, my God, this guy is the real thing. Um, anyway, so maybe that's my rock and roll story for today. That's <laughs> Cool, man. Well, I'm glad it could be of, be of service. And Tristan, make sure you uh, you come back and visit me when you're when you're here. Too bad. There'll be a bottle of scotch waiting for you. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> what? Bye, buddy. Rock and roll. Thanks, man. See you in LA. Yeah. Take care. Bye, fellas.